Our handicap is our flashlight. Now, for those listening who speak the King's English, it would be your torch. So for Americans, it's the flashlight, but for the British and the Australians and the New Zealanders and, and the people in India who speak a different English, it's a torch. Our handicap is our torch or our flashlight, our small range of consciousness. We have a very small range of consciousness. We have a very narrow beam on our torch, on our flashlight, and it's rather dim. I have said in the past that all we are is snails with bright flashlights, and then I've changed that to all we are is snails with dim flashlights. So we're very slow moving, and we have very dim flashlights. And if we could find the Energizer Bunny and get some better batteries, then maybe we'd see better. And that's what this work is about. This work is about finding the Energizer. Now, this is horrible for people in other countries because they don't know this commercial about the Energizer Bunny. But all it's about is getting good batteries that last longer and make for brighter torchlight. So our range of consciousness is very narrow. We have dim lights by which to see into the darkness of ourselves. Now, of course, this is all figures. These are all figures for what's really going on. Of course, we don't really have flashlights. We don't really have torches. We don't really have batteries in them. We aren't really shining them around. But when we're talking about our internal world, we use, I use, external examples because they're easier for us to grasp than the internal things because we're not very familiar with this internal world, because we spend so much time glued to this external world out here that we forget that there is an internal world altogether. Now, how could you forget that you have an internal world? Well, it's easy. You do it all the time, every day. As a matter of fact, we forget much more than we remember. That's why the work says, well, you have to remember yourself. That's the beginning of everything is remembering yourself. What do you mean, remember myself? I remember myself all the time. What are you talking about? The lack of light is compounded by our pride, our vanity, and our imagination. They don't wish to see the contradictions to the pictures that we have of ourselves. So they're constantly standing in front of the light. <laughs> they don't want us. It's like, oh, or, you know, it's like somebody comes over to your house unexpectedly. You didn't have time to vacuum, clean, do all of the things that you, well, that you would do if you cared. And so what you do is there's certain you just go close a door here and close the door. They, just, they don't see that. You take pick stuff up. You see them coming up the drive. You pick stuff up. You throw it in that room. And you close the door. They're not going in that room. You know what I mean? OK, so there are, so there are those of those of you who actually have done this, then yeah. good. OK, then we're, we're, we're tracking here. That's our pride and our vanity. We don't want people to see how we are because we have pictures of how we're supposed to be and how we want them to think we are. And so we lie, pure and simple. We lie, we obfuscate, we hide, we pretend we are false. We build up this huge false personality with which we interface. Interface is a horrible word to use about people. With which, because it's a, it's a machine thing, machine interface is really what it is. We interact with one another, but, but in a sense we do interface because it is very mechanical, it is very automatic. So we interact, but we're really interfacing. We're really sending the machine out to meet whoever's come up the drive. The machine puts on the smile, the machine puts on the face, the machine hides everything that it doesn't want these people to see or this person to see. And so in a very real sense, that's what we do with ourselves. When our real self comes around, we hide it. We have these buffers, the doors. We put these things behind it. We close the door, a buffer so that these contradictions, who we'd like other people to think we are, who we'd like ourselves to think we are, and who we actually are, the pictures of who we actually are, we have to keep them far apart. So we have these doors, these rooms. So we put them in. They're buffers. So a buffer is something that stands between the contradictions about ourselves. A large part of us stays mechanically ignorant. We don't see the pictures, just that simple. So there's a huge, vast tract of us that stays mechanically ignorant in the dark because it's a lot more comfortable than facing what we might find there or what we know that we have found there. So we know we found things there and we had serious judgments about it or other people had bad reactions and serious judgments about it. So we found that the best thing to do is to lie. The best thing to do is to pretend it's not there. The best thing to do is to run some phony thing out here and present that rather than the real thing. And that way we don't have to deal with the heat of someone not agreeing with us. 
of someone thinking that we're not okay. We don't have to deal with the friction that happens then. We don't have to deal with the internal feelings and conflicts that we have inside of ourselves when someone out there who we want to like us doesn't because of something that they've seen that we didn't want them to see or that they didn't want to see. And now we don't want them to see ever again because we don't like their reaction. We have a picture of having no picture. This is the thing about us is that we are so clever, so complex. The machine is always working. It's always working, shoring up this, building up that, slapping a new coat of paint on this, putting some plaster over that, putting a couple throw pillows in front of the crack over there in the door, anything to keep the light out, putting paper over the window, anything to keep the light out. Because the light is the enemy. The enemy to what? The enemy to the darkness, where we get to hide all these things. The room that nobody goes into, where we get to hide all that stuff and close the door because we didn't have time to pick it up. It's actually, it didn't have anything to do with, well, I didn't have time to clean the house if I'd known you were coming. It didn't have anything to do with that. You live in that squalor all the time, and you are fine with it because you take it all for granted. But when somebody else comes, it's like, oh, man, they're going to find out that I take it all for granted. So I better lie. Talking with some of you reveals a powerful resistance to pictures that you don't know you have. Nobody in this group thinks, oh, I have, I have a picture that I have no pictures. If you do think that, you're only thinking it because I'm saying it. But it's not something that you were thinking before I started saying it. Now, of course, some of you think everything before I say it. Those of you who are, what would have been put as psychic, I guess. You know, you, that's exactly what I was thinking. Well, that's what I was, I thought of that two weeks ago. Great, I'm glad. I'm glad to be able to put into words what you think. That's a talent, you know, as far as I'm concerned, because obviously you're not doing it. Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to try and communicate this. And as I've said before, this is why you're doing your presentations on Wednesdays, so that you can learn how to communicate your thoughts. Yes, you've had all these brilliant thoughts, but what good are they until you can communicate them, until you can make them happen in your life? Well, it's just more brilliant thoughts, just more brilliant ideas that never went anywhere. Like the idea of having hydrogen-powered cars, you know, so that we can get rid of fossil fuels altogether, clean up the environment, stop this whole insanity in the Middle East with oil. Just have a little tablet. You fill your tank with water. You drop a little tablet in. It does something with the molecules, turns to hydrogen. The uh, engine is then designed to burn hydrogen, and there you go. You drive away, and there's nothing left. You know, there's no pollution left. Well, it's a great idea. Let's do that. Oh, I thought of that years ago. See what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, I thought of that. I never thought about that years ago. Well, great, where is it? Well, I haven't thought of that yet. I haven't thought of how to do it yet. Well, I was going to do it, but the oil companies wouldn't let me. I was going to do it, but the car companies wouldn't let me. Yeah, okay. So I find this resistance and then incredible swift maneuvers to turn the tables. Like I'll say, for example, I'll say to Matt, um, and I think last week I said this, Matt, what did your parents think of you? And he said, well, my dad, really, I was his favorite. You know, well, what did your mother think? Well, I don't know. She never, she was not very expressive. She never really said much of anything. So your mother really didn't think anything. Well, no, I don't know. That's a lie. You blocked out whatever your mother thought because it didn't agree with what your father thought. Your father, you were his favorite. Your mother, you were just another of the 10 kids. Uh, which one are you now? Number what? What's your name? See, because the, look, all the mothers know this. You go to call your kids, it's like, Harry, J J Jack, uh, Sally, you, whatever your name is, get over here, right? You know, and you forget who they are. It's like, you just like, you, get over here. You stand there. You do this. You pick up that. So anyway, and anybody from a big family knows, you always get called whatever name is handy to the person who's calling. It's like, well, who are you? Just do it. Just go get there. It doesn't matter whose name they're using. If they're looking at you, you better move. <laughs> Remember? Okay. They have these maneuvers. So I'll say, Matt, you're just not aware of what your mother thought of you. And Matt will say, oh, well, that's exactly what I think you do. Well, that's great, Matt. That's, that's really, okay. Well, maybe I do that. Yeah, okay. So what, what Matt has effectively done is he has effectively shifted his possibility of changing himself and becoming the person that he wants to be. He's effectively shifted that onto me so that now I have the possibility to change myself and become the person I want to be. And Matt gets to say the same. Bravo. 
Good job. And if your goal was to stay the same, and let's face it, that's your goal. Now we have an aim, a work aim that says, I want to change because I don't want to be this person anymore. I want to be some other person. But isn't it interesting that every time that I go to talk to you about that person that you want to change so badly, you almost always turn it around so that that person doesn't change a thing. It's those people out there need to change. Think about it. This is astounding to me. And it happens so regularly and so quickly that I'm pretty much speechless when it happens. I'm just like, uh, okay. Then we've reached an impasse. There's nothing to talk about because your idea that you wanted to change is gone now. Your idea that you wanted to be a different person so that you could have a different level of being, so that you could manifest a different life, that's now gone. Now your new idea is when you people change, my life will be better. My life will be different. Now that's an old one because that's where we came from. But like a dog returns to its vomit, we're always back there licking that up again. Sorry for those of you who are up here and I get excited and <laughs> spit. I really get excited about these ideas. I was watching, uh, Lori for Christmas gave me uh, the extended edition of The Lord of the Rings. So I've been watching how they made it. And they get to this actor who does Gollum. And I think the guy is fantastic. But he does this voice and, you know, and all this stuff, and he's very animated. He's a physical actor. And this guy is just spitting all over the place. I mean, it's running down his chin, and it's flying here and there. People are getting showered. And I thought, man, this guy is really into it. You know, and other people are like, get away from me. <laughs> Stop spitting on me. I feel like that sometimes. I feel like I get carried away by these ideas they become i get so emotional about them and i end up forgetting that i shouldn't be spitting on people so i try and stand back further but it's your fault really <laughs> you set the chairs up too close see and this is exactly what we're talking about i don't need to change you need to change but if i'm going to become the person i want to be i have to face these things because the only way for me to get there is I will have to change. I will have to be a different person in order to be a better person. I will have to be a different person. I will have to change things that I now think are good. Not only good, but a lot better than you. And that is the crux of it. See, right there is where we really live. That's where the rubber meets the road, as it were. Well, I'm better than you. So don't you try to tell me what I should do to change, because I'm better than you. Okay then I won't. Is there anything wrong? No, there's nothing wrong. What do you mean? You're not like talking to me or anything. What's there to say? Well, you know, you usually have something to say. Well, yeah, but you're better than me. So what's there to say? I mean, what can I say? Well, you could say, I worship you. You're wonderful. Okay, I worship you. You're wonderful. Well, you didn't really mean that. Well, no, that's true. I didn't really mean that. But why are you lying? Well, because it sounds like that's what you want. Well, you never did that before. Well, <laughs> Okay, okay. You see what I mean? It's like, where do you go with this? Where do you go with this? It was just like, is life just about arguing? Is life just about getting your way? Is life just about being right? Is it just about staying the way you are? And we have to answer that, yes. Yes, it's just about that. And all the time it's just about that, we long to be different. So we're conflicted. We're crazy. Unfortunately, we're not schizophrenic enough. We can't get separate personalities out of this. We can't see one over there and say, oh, yeah, well, there's that one again. We call that one over there Jane. We call that one over there Mary. We call that one over there Bill. We call that one over there Harry. No, we call them all I. And so we're lost. So the effectiveness of that whole thing is deadly. No light makes it into the pictures. And the people, we remain intact. We stay the same. Our work aim is to observe them. But how to do it with such overwhelming opposition? That's always the question. There's such overwhelming opposition to the light. How do we do it? And that's why we always talk about this union of opposites again and again and again, and why we talk about opposites and why we talk about these things, is because unless we can get into the trenches with these eyes, with these conflicts, and struggle with them and wrestle with them and make some kind of progress or at least see some things that we didn't see before about ourselves, then how can we ever expect to be different? So here's what to do. When you're upset or unpraised, look for some picture at work in you. So you're upset. Well, why am I upset? He's not talking to me. Okay. Well, he hasn't told me that I did a good job. Okay. Instead of looking to the person, why haven't you told me I did a good job? Why are you doing that? We need to look inside of ourselves for some picture at work in us. Do you see what I'm talking about? 
don't look out there. There's no answer for you out there. The answer for you is in here. Look for a picture inside of you that is working. But I don't have any pictures. Right, there's the first picture. The picture that you have no picture. So look there then. Well, how about that? I have a picture that I don't have any pictures. Well, that's crazy because of course I have pictures. Well, how do you know? You don't see any, do you? Well, no, I don't see any, but that doesn't mean there aren't any there. So I can't see the forest for the trees right now. But that doesn't mean there aren't any trees. Or that doesn't mean there isn't a forest. So that's our first step. This may help us to observe whatever picture is at work in us. It may help us. It may not. But it's at least something to start with. And we need something to start with. We need something we can get hold of. We need something we can get our fingers around. We need something that we can get the light shined on. That's the first place to look. Look inside of yourself for some picture at work in you. I'm upset. Whatever the reason you're upset, whatever the reason you think you're upset, look inside of yourself for some picture working in you. If you are looking outside of yourself at some other people, you're lost. You're already in the wrong field. You'll never find the ball in left field if it was hit into right field. That's it. So you've got to get in the right field. First, seeing the picture and then observing what contradicts it is the harmonizing process that brings opposites together. First, we have to see that we have a picture at work in us because that, obviously, if we're looking for something out there, if we're looking at somebody else, we're talking to somebody else about their problems, we're missing the picture. The picture is in here, we're missing it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to see, oh, I have a picture that had no pictures. So that's the first picture, okay? Well, that picture leads to, well, there are pictures in there. Now, what picture is at work in me that I'm not seeing? So we have to start looking for it. That gives us an opportunity to observe it. An opportunity doesn't mean it's a lock. Doesn't mean you get, doesn't mean you're, you gotta be good at this. You gotta be quick, you gotta be persistent, you gotta be genuine, you gotta be sincere. You're gonna lose. You will not get there. It takes hard work. I love it when somebody, I, every once in a while I'll find somebody who writes, somebody will write to me from podcasts, this is hard work. <laughs> yes, that's right. And I'm so excited that somebody found that they got that far. That they got beyond the point of just listening and going, oh, that's right, that's right, oh, my wife should hear this, oh, Harry should hear this at work. You know, I'm so glad when they go, this is hard work. This work is so right, but it's so hard. I mean, I got this from somebody. This work is so right, but it's so hard. All right, now we're talking. Now I've connected with somebody. Now I got somebody who's getting it. All right, you're getting what I'm talking about. Now, if you found it hard, you're starting to get it. If you want to scratch my eyes out, you're starting to get it. If you want to turn me off, good, you're starting to get it. Now, go and look and see what pictures are at work in you to want to scratch my eyes out and turn me off. Because I'm your best friend. And you got some picture at work in you that says that's not true. Find that picture. And then find what contradicts it. Here you get this picture that I'm the enemy. Good, find what contradicts it. Well, there isn't anything that contradicts it. Everything says that that's true. Find what contradicts it. It's easy to find what supports it. In that state of mind, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. When you're negative, it's easy to be negative. It doesn't take any work. It doesn't take any effort to be negative. No. In your negative, the real effort involved is finding the opposite of that. Can you even remember when I wasn't a mean, horrible person that made your life miserable? No, I can't remember a time like that. Then what are you doing here? Well, okay, maybe there was a time. But that was a long time ago. That was years ago. That was when you were really nice. But you changed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Can you see that you got pictures at work in you and they're just killing you? Now you got to find what contradicts them. What contradicts them is, man, I remember when he was there for me. I got this picture that says he's going to abandon me. Okay, find what contradicts that. Well, <laughs> the guy stood by me for 20 years. He's never gone anywhere. He's always, I call him, he's there. He's never said, no, you can't come over. No, you can't talk to me. No, I don't want anything to do with you. And even if he said it, it didn't matter because he still did it. Because here I am. So that contradicts that, doesn't it? I mean, you're going to abandon me. Well, what contradicts that? Well, I'm standing right here in front of you. That's what contradicts that. Good. Find that. Bring that together with the other picture of he's abandoning me. Bring those two pictures together. So instead of yes or no, you have yes and no. And you bring those together and you find something begins to harmonize. That's what this work teaches. Bringing contradictions together is like making the inner and the outer the same. It's going against one-sidedness. And it prevents the mechanical action of the pendulum, or at least slows it down. It may not prevent it, but it slows it down. And that's what we want to do. We want to make headway. We want to make progress. See, the problem is, is that both of these pictures lie in darkness, and they're acting on us beyond our control, just as it has to do if it's not in the light of consciousness. If it's in the dark, it's going to act on you beyond your control. So we've got this picture. He's mean to me. We've got that picture. But we don't know we have that picture. 
How could you say we don't know we had that picture? He's mean to me. Yes, but he's being mean to me. It's not my picture. He really is mean. That's the picture that you have no picture, you see. Mm -hmm. You've got to get to that picture. But then he gets away scot-free? He just gets away with being mean to me? <laughs> Do you see the lock it's got on us? Do you see the headlock it's got us in? The chokehold? There is no way out of that unless you are willing to abandon the whole thing and sacrifice yourself. Okay, fine. I have to change then. You don't have to change. You're perfect just the way you are. Good, now you got it. Oh, yeah, that's great for you. <laughs> yes, that's great for me. Except that over here in my world, I have to do the exact same thing with you. Oh, you do? Well, but that must be easy for you since I really am perfect. Well, yes, it's so much easier for me than it is for you. Yeah. You know, it's just like, stop being insane. Well, you can't, can you? You see, and even as I talk about this, you're going, oh, my God, just kill me and get it over with. You know, just kill me because there's no way out of this. But there is a way out. It's a long way out. It takes a long time and it's hard work, but there is a way. And how you know that is you have made progress. Now, it's not a lot of progress, I admit. But it's some, which means progress can be made. Yes, but when I look at how much progress I've made in this amount of time, I think, there are not enough years left. Well, remember what we talked about in the light podcast earlier about what happens after you die? <laughs> Maybe there are plenty of years left. Maybe there aren't. And if there aren't, don't worry about it. And if there are, don't worry about it. So don't worry about it. Just work today. Do what you can do today. That's what's important. Do what you can do today. If you can get a little bit better today, your life has improved today. So that's good, right? But I haven't made it to where I want to be. Well, but you're closer. And that's what we've got now. So let's enjoy that. This brings consciousness toward the center where yes and no exist. This strengthens the whole being. The whole of you then becomes strong. Right now, what we're doing is we're making ourselves very lopsided, like people who've had strokes. We've got this one dead side that we're dragging around with the strong side. And what bringing these things together does is it starts to strengthen the dead side, the side that's in the darkness. It starts to strengthen it. Oh, but we don't want that strength, and it's bad. Well, but when it is blended with the strong side, with the other side, it's not bad anymore, because the two create a new thing, a third thing, a whole being. That is our hope. That's the alchemy of the whole thing. That's what's so damned exciting about this. There's no way that you take this brick and this brick, and you put the two bricks together, what do you got? You got two bricks. Yes, but magically, when you put these two bricks together, you get a third thing. How did that happen? I don't know. Does it matter? Well, I was meditating this morning. I was thinking, God, I was raised with magic. I was raised a Roman Catholic. I mean, hello, the whole thing is magic. I, from a little kid, I believed in magic. I mean, everything was magic. Well, there was this woman, and she got pregnant without having sex. Wow, that's cool. So then she had this baby who was born perfect. Wow. Now, he died, and he's gone, but he came back, but we can't see him. But now, this piece of bread is now his body. And when I bless it, it magically turns into his body and blood. And when you eat it, you are actually eating his body and drinking his blood. Wow. I mean, it's all magic. So I looked at it and thought, well, gee, no wonder I believe in magic. I mean, I was raised on the stuff. A lot of those ideas now have been transmuted and transcended into something else. They were childish ideas because I was a child when I was taught those things. But now I see them in a totally different way. Now I look at them and I go, wow, all this means something. Now find what it means. And that's always exciting. So this is the way that growth can proceed forward. Without this, nothing can happen. An impasse has reached a, a constriction, an interval. You've got to get to the point where you bring these two things together from yes or no to yes and no. At that point, something magical can happen. Some kind of alchemy can happen. Some kind of bonding of molecules that can't happen any other way can create then a third thing from the two things that is not either of the two things. It's a new thing, a third thing. Self-conceit has to be destroyed so that you have the opportunity to feel another kind of person. Obviously, what stands in the way is this incredible self-conceit that we have. You have no right to treat me this way. You need to treat me better. I've always treated you better. You owe it to me to treat me this way. People, that's self-conceit. It's pretty stupid, too, since that's not the way the world works. The way the world actually works is, you're lucky to be alive. You're lucky to have this opportunity. You're lucky to be sitting here. You're lucky to be able to be hearing what I'm saying to you. You are so blessed. But do you know that? No, mostly you take it for granted, just like you take your entire life for granted. I was thinking about this 
I guess, who was I talking? I was talking to Jennifer this morning. Somebody asked me to write six weird things about me. Now, there aren't six weird things about me. There's nothing weird about me. Everything about me is normal to me. Why is that? Well, I thought, why is that? Well, why that is because I take everything for granted about me. But then someone else wrote six weird things about them. And I thought, wow, that was really interesting. I didn't know that. And that was really interesting. But they thought it was all normal. They didn't think there was anything weird or interesting about it at all. We're not interesting to other people. That's what we think. We're not interested. People, would, why would anybody be interested in me? Because we've taken ourselves for granted. When you stop taking yourself for granted, you realize what a walking, talking miracle you are, and you understand, well, people should be interested in me. If they're not, it's probably because they're taking me for granted, and because they take themselves for granted, and they take all of life for granted. They're asleep! If you don't find me interesting, you're asleep. If I don't find you interesting, I'm asleep. There's a picture. Pull that one out. Put it in the light. I love these pictures, you know. It's like, you remember, you've done photography, right? So, I mean, you know, in the dark room. When a picture is still unfixed, you can take it out into the light, but it doesn't take long, and it just is go it's just gone. It just all turns blue. These pictures have to be unfixed, as it were, so that the light has an opportunity to just eliminate them. And that's what we're up to here. We're up to allowing the light of consciousness to eliminate these pictures, because these pictures are not what we need to be living by. We need to be living by what's actually so, not what was so, or what we'd like to be so. So self-conceit's got to go. We must be able to walk around ourselves and see more sides or nothing can begin. So I can walk around him and see more sides of him, more parts of him, and examine him better. Got to be able to do that. Well, I can't do that if I'm full of self-conceit, because I'm living inside of that, not outside of it. When you start to live outside of it, it's very difficult to be full of self-conceit when you can live outside yourself and walk around yourself. You walk around yourself, you start to see your insignificance. You start to see your smallness in relation to the universe, and you go, oh, okay, well, okay, if there's some possibility for me, wow, that's really cool. It's going to take a lot of work. It couldn't possibly be that much work. And even if it is, so what? I mean, this is what I got, and that's what I could have. The work's worth it. Do you see the difference? Stop taking yourself for granted. Why? Because you can begin to understand the language of yes and no, in which higher centers speak to us, when you begin to be able to stand outside yourself and walk around yourself and look at yourself as an interesting stranger. You begin to understand a different language. Only in higher divisions of centers that such work is possible. This work cannot be done in the centers that we live in normally. It just can't be done. It's like the Sermon on the Mount. Well, you can't do that. Well, that's true. You can't. Not in your normal, ordinary state of consciousness. You can't do that. But if you can get into a higher state of consciousness, it will just ooze out of your pores. You won't have to love your enemy. You won't have to work to love your enemy. When you get into a higher state of consciousness, you don't have any enemies. Everybody's a friend. And that's really the way it is. I mean, surely you have been in a state of consciousness where everybody was your friend where the universe was a conspiracy for your good. You've been in that state of consciousness. You have to see that you're not in that state of consciousness most of the rest of the time. You've got to see that the lower states in which we dwell normally are what's making our lives miserable. But these higher states are what will make our lives miraculous. That brings the magic back to it. it. Brings the wonder back to everything. Lower divisions, as the formatory part, can only work in yes or no. They don't have anything else, yes or no. Do you like me or not like me? <laughs> sometimes I like you, sometimes I don't like you. Yeah, that's not an answer. <laughs> yes, it is an answer. It's not an answer to me. No, now, not in those low parts of centers, it's not an answer. It's yes or no, only yes or no. When you're formatory, that's where you're at. When you're formatory, you need to get out of that. The answer is not fix the other people around you. The answer is get out of the formatory state. Get out of the lower states. Get in the higher states. You can only get into higher divisions of centers through valuation of the work. Let's take the example of you do the same thing. Everyone else does that, but, you know, yeah, that's exactly what I think you do. We must remember to value our aim and the work's ability to help us reach it. It doesn't matter what everybody else does. As my mother used to say when I was a kid, Well, if everybody else was jumping off a bridge, would you do that too? <laughs> well, no. Well, then don't tell me what everybody else is doing. Like, uh... <laughs> You know, it's not fair that parents know that kind of stuff. You know, when you're a kid, you're trying to explain why you did something that you know you shouldn't have done because they told you not to, not because it was wrong. Hey, parents don't tell you not to do things because the things are wrong. 
They tell you not to do things because they don't want something to happen to you that's out of their control. That's why they're telling It's like, don't have sex. So they're not telling you not to have sex because it's wrong. They're telling you not to have sex because it gets out of control when you're a little dude. I mean, let's face it, it gets out of control when you're a big dude. I mean, they're big people who are out there having sex and screwing up their lives. Like old people who are going and having affairs and ruining their families and, you know, their kids and their divorces and all this stuff. For what? Duh. I mean, you know, when you look at it, it's like D-U-M. But we don't look at it. We just, oh, it's making me, look what it's making me do. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not like that. Work flags have to go up for us at these trigger points when we feel we're being rejected, criticized, judged, whatever, whatever it is, mistreated, not paid what we're owed. That's when the work flags need to go up for us. When we're looking out there at what's wrong with them, the work flags better be waving in our face. If they're not, we're lost. Unless you've got a friend who can come and shake you out of your stupid stupor. But sometimes we get ourselves so locked into a place that we don't, we don't even have any friends left. Even the people who love us and would lay down their lives for us become the enemy. Then we really got ourselves in a pickle. But that happens too. Our pride and vanity have to be brought into the light of consciousness in relation to our work game. A conscious decision has to be made. What am I going to do? Am I going to follow this path that is obviously leading me down where everyone else is wrong and I'm the only one who's right? Or am I going to get in touch with my nothingness and start to step outside myself, walk around myself, and see what's wrong with me instead of what's wrong with them? It's a conscious decision you've got to come to. You have to come to that. You can't come to that if all of your energy to come to a conscious decision has been squandered in negative emotions. You have nothing left. The valuation of the work will help us because it puts us in higher parts. Love the work. Love the rope. Love the lifeline. Love the possibility that you could change. Love the possibility that your life could be different if you just found something outside of yourself, higher than you, that you could get hold of. Love that. That valuation will automatically start to draw you toward higher centers. The valuation of the work helps to put us in higher parts of ourselves. Nothing outside of you. It's just something inside of you. More inner, less outer. It draws you away from the outside toward the inside. When you're looking at what they've done to you, you are connected to the outside through your senses. You're lost. When you're looking at you, you're connected to the inside through a whole different sense. What's the organ? The organ of self-remembering, what it is. The ability to see inside of yourself. These higher parts gradually pass toward higher centers. Get into these higher parts, they will lead you to higher centers. Just like water seeks its own level, these higher parts of yourself, inside of yourself, will lead you to higher centers. They'll lead you to something higher. And so you raise your consciousness. You raise your level of being. You raise yourself out of the pit in which you put yourself. <laughs>